how good are our measurements? If you see the two slides in front of you now, you will see Lindzen and Choi's result uh, there on your left, and you will see the recent challenge to it by the ClimateGate emailers uh, there on your right. And uh, clearly there are enormous disputes going on in the peer-reviewed literature between various factions as to where the truth lies. And a lot of the problem, in my view, arises from exactly the factor that you mentioned, sir, which is that so many of the measurements that we're dealing with in the climate are so staggeringly uncertain. And all of us on every side in this debate are looking for the silver bullet that will kill the vampire, the one clear definitive measurement that will show us what climate sensitivity actually is. There are a number of different ways of approaching it and they're interpreted in different ways and people argue them backwards and forwards and it's very difficult to get agreement on these things given that the uh, tools we're using for measurement are still so woefully inadequate and indeed there is a general problem caused by the fact that we're dealing with a mathematically chaotic object in which long-run prediction and the UN's climate panel itself says this, so I'm not saying anything contra controversial here, in which long-run uh, prediction is actually impossible by any method because we cannot know the initial conditions of the object to a sufficient precision to make reliable long-term predictions. Now that's not to say that you can't still take some view on whether if you load the atmosphere with lots of extra CO2 it will cause some warming. Of course it will and you can use various methods to try and work out how much warming. But for anyone to try to say that there is a consensus in the literature as to how much warming would be caused, I think that would be a mistake. And I will be showing you one or two papers later, later which will illustrate, illustrate which way I think things are now beginning to move in that very interesting debate. Thank you for your question, sir. Yes. Okay. Thank um, you. Thank you. Uh, <coughs> sorry. I, it was addressed to both of Yeah, surely. No, 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 absolutely. It, yeah. um, so what was I going to say? Uh, Next. There you've made me forget. Hang on. The, uh, yeah, Lindzen and, Lindzen and Choi, it's actually quite interesting, the difference in results you get. And all they did to show, look, they think they were wrong, is it wasn't about the uncertainty of the measurements, it was just the interpretation of the data. In order to, to work out the effects, you've got to compare cooling periods with warming periods, and there was something very strange about Lindzen and Choi's cooling and warming periods, in that you can see here that right at the end there, they sort of, their cooling period actually included part of a warming period, and if you started at the natural spot, where it was at its maximum, the results completely went away. So there's a... Big pardon? No, they can't, people can't hear your question, sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. Are you trying to say that, um, that that graph there was, not done, was done by, uh, by calculation rather than uh, by satellite measurement? The graph, yes. the graph of the satellite measurements, you get all this data, the challenge for the scientists is to interpret what that means. You have all this thing, you've measured something, it's quite a complicated system you're measuring, you're trying to get from there back to what does that tell us about the climate? So can I, I, My, can, I have, can I finish, please? Thank you. Um, and that leads us to the second part of Lord Monckton's answer, which he said, this problem is fundamentally unsolvable because it's chaotic. No, I said and it's complicated by the fact that it's chaotic. Well, you said the IPCC said it, there was no, you couldn't do it. So yes, the IPCC says that. Yes, absolutely. thank you. Yes. Okay. And, and, and change of Excuse me, just let me finish and then maybe we can get back to you because I think this is an important point to make. And that's a mistake. Weather, what they were talking about was weather. Weather is chaotic. You cannot predict it a long time in the future. But climate is something that is actually really quite predictable. We keep having summer and winter and they seem to keep happening at the same time of the year. And the reason for that difference, if you're trying to predict things, is the nature of the problem. And Lord Munkin talked about an initial value problem, and that's because weather is an initial value problem. And when I studied differential equations at university, we learned there were two fundamental differences between two different sorts of differential equations. Initial value problems, and what happens with those is you have an initial condition of system, and you try to work out what happens in the future. And the solutions to those are unstable. You keep going in the future, you get bigger and bigger errors, and up after a certain amount of time, like when you're trying to predict weather, you really can't say what's going on. But climate is not an initial value problem. It's a boundary value problem. 
That means you've got some constraints on the system and you're trying to work out the equilibrium system. And that's something that you can do. And that's why climate, thing, climate things cannot predict the weather 100 years in the future, but they can predict the average of that. They can predict the climate. Hey, look, so. look, we'll go on. We'll take another question. I would just say to you, sir, though, one of the consequences of this uh, debate around the world is that people apologise for being sceptics. There shouldn't be any pejorative sense associated to a sceptic. Better to be sceptical than gullible. Yeah. Better to be sceptical than gullible. Yes, the lady right at the back. I think the question is, why is global warming catastrophic? Aren't there benef wouldn't there be beneficiaries of such a consequence? Uh, yeah, sure. The answer is, um, if we get a little bit of warming, yeah, there'll be places that get, where it gets better, places where it gets worse, and uh, there'll there'll be a part the you know partly it'll partly counterbalance. But if we get a lot of warming, um, then the bad stuff starts to outweigh the good stuff by a lot. I mean, if you think, for example, of sea level, really, where the sea level goes up and down, you think shouldn't really make a difference. The trouble is that we built a lot of our civilization at sea level. So if it goes down, it's bad. If it goes up, it's, it, it's also bad because we've either got to move stuff away or build sea walls or dredge ports or whatever. Same with agriculture. If we get sort of the climate changes, then suddenly we've got to suddenly say, oh, no longer we can grow fruit here, we've got to do something else. And it's going to be expensive and difficult to, to change things. So, yeah, there'll be some benefits, but on the whole, it'll be, it'll be bad if there's a lot of warming. Lord Moncton? Yes. Warming is a good thing. The more warming, within reason, the better. But that's why the central question is, this climate sensitivity question. And that's where you've seen and will yet see the tussle between us on what climate sensitivity really is, and in particular the meaning of Dr. Pinker's paper. Because if climate sensitivity is low, then we are not going to cause much warming. If it is high, then we may cause much warming. And until that question is resolved, trying to take the kind of very costly, very damaging, indeed even murderous decisions that have already been rushed into is an extremely bad idea. Mm. Cool. Yes, sir, we're moving across the room. Thank you. The man at the back. Yeah, that's you with the glasses. Thanks. Uh, my question is uh, related to the uh, climate change issue that was raised earlier. If you show your global temperature chart again. Uh, if I can find it again. Uh, whoops. There, 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 that one. That's the one. Um, so the first issue there is, again, I, I was wondering if you can expand upon the question of why, if everything is in fact, if we're to understand that so much of climate is just driven by this single factor of CO2 concentration, why exactly was it that temperatures went up at such a rapid rate, according to the UN's own data, between 1910 and 1940, when with very little CO2 increase, conversely, why was it that they didn't actually went down for a period between 1940 and, let's say, 1970, when apparently, when actually CO2 concentration was increased even more rapidly? Right? And just as a further follow up question, just in relation to the fact that we're now having a panic about global warming, but uh, global warming, but back in the mid 1970s, there were lots of front pages and uh, you know, Time and Newsweek, I can't remember which magazine had the front, uh, the front cover about the coming ice age, and we were being exhorted at that time. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so that was two questions yes. to me. OK, I'll, I'll do my best to answer both of them. So if I can flick forward a few more times and see if I can find a right chart here. I've got that. Whoop, uh, ah, that one. OK. So the question was, what about the temperature increase up to about 1940? Temperatures went up and CO2 was going up but by not as much as it's going up at the moment. So what explained that? Well, the answer is that 
CO2 isn't the only thing that affects climate, and the scientists don't say 